This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 22 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today's episode is a bonus mini show, so there won't be the usual intro um, to the podcast. I will just dive straight into it. Today's episode, I am going to take you through the key takeaways from Mark Dawson's self-publishing show, which was live in London on the 9th of March. And for those listening in the future, that is 9th of March 2020. Okay, so takeaway one. Patricia McLean was one of the panellists and she said something that I think really encapsulates my view of the indie world and the business that I'm personally trying to cultivate and grow and run. So her takeaway was take the long view. Her very first book, which she wrote and published over 30 years ago, is still selling today. That means she's still earning money from something that she did over 30 years ago. Now, I'm sure some of you listening aren't even 30 years old. That's crazy. That means she has been earning money off something she created for longer than you've been alive. I mean, I'm only just over 30. Um, So yeah, I mean, this is crazy. This is the power of intellectual property and the power of what we are doing when we create um, something. It will last forever. And if we keep marketing it and we keep pushing it, then we will continue to earn from it. There will always be people who have not heard of your books before. Your book might not be new to you anymore, but it will be new to somebody who hasn't seen it or come across it before. So just because your books might be two or three or five years old, don't think that they are no longer useful. Don't think just because certain industries, you know, bookstores run on debuts and launches and, you know, that crucial six-week period. That's nonsense. That's not how it has to work. That's not how it works for indie authors. I mean, the thing that really is crazy for me is to think about the ROI. So yes, okay, she may have spent a month working on it, but she has now been paid for that month's work every single month for 30 consecutive years. Like, what? When you look at the, um, you know, rat race, working for the man type business model, you do work once in a month and then you get paid for that work once. And that's why I think the um, publishing model is so fantastic for indie authors, because we are essentially creating a pension for ourselves. Charlotte Lotter was another one of the panellists on the same panel and she agreed saying there's no choice. If you want to do this for the long term, you have to treat this like a business. And that is something that I am deeply, deeply passionate about. I have always seen my writing as a business. Um, And I know some of you might not want to do this full time. And that's okay. That's fine. Even if you are doing this just to get some pocket money or just because it's a passion project, whatever the reasons are fine. But if you do want to do this as a career and for your full time job, then you must treat this like a business. What does that mean? That means you need to separate your finances. It means you need to be a good publisher, not just a good writer. It means you need to do marketing. You have to learn about finances and uh, what ROI, your return on investment means, and, you know, how to experiment and iterate with your ads. It means you might need to spend another £100 and do a hardcover um, for your fiction book as well as a, a paperback. You know, this this is what having a business looks like. It means making sure you cash flow plan and whether you write it down or not, that you have some kind of long view and strategic plan for how you will grow and develop your business. And the reflection, I guess, that I came away with is that sometimes we get very caught up and concerned with needing things now. 
Um, I know that I definitely suffer from this. I get very excited by my projects and I just want them done and I want them published and I want them, you know, written and finished and, and I want the cover now, now, now. Um, but that, if this isn't um, a lesson in taking the long view from Patricia and the fact that she has been earning from a book that she published 30 years ago, then I really don't know what it is. Yes, this book, this series, this project that you're working on right now is important. It feels significant. But if you are in this for the long haul, then so will every other project you work on. This is about creating assets that you can earn income from for the rest of your life, not just today. Takeaway two, and I love this one because it's super empowering. This takeaway is do it your way. I think um, there's a lot of myth and people getting caught up in studying how the big guns, the big rollers, the big famous indie authors are making their money. And yes, to some extent, that is very useful to look at what models could work. But here's the thing. I've been in this industry for a while now, and I am yet to see two authors with identical business models. There was a panel called Under the Radar um, at the SPF Live, and this panel consisted of five six-figure authors who were all writing in a variety of genres, and they were all using different methods of selling books. Now, here's the thing. That was five authors, all of whom were earning over six figures. Now, I, you know, I'm not here to judge who needs what or who thinks what amount of money is a lot of money. As far as I'm concerned, if I or anybody earns over six figures a year, over £100,000 a year, that's going to be a fairly comfortable life. Um, you know, the average wage in the UK, I think, is something like 25,000 a year. So if you're earning essentially five times that figure, you're doing pretty well. Um, and the point is, none of these authors had got there in the same way. Some were using Facebook ads, others weren't. Some were doing Amazon ads and some were just growing their lists organically. The point that I'm trying to make is that you should feel empowered. Just because the authors who are, you know, vocal in the community are doing it one particular way, that doesn't mean that that is the only way in which you can do it. Every genre, every subgenre, every niche has a different way of working. You, one author can try Facebook ads and they can't, they might not work. Another author might try a new innovative way of working the Facebook ads and they might work. The thing is, unless you experiment, unless you try, you just don't know what will work. And the thing is, each one of them had essentially found their way to their readers by doing the things that they enjoyed and vo avoiding, for the most part, the things that they didn't. Now, look, that's not to say that avoiding perhaps working with the numbers or doing marketing at all is going to get you where you need to be. Of course, we all have to do some form of marketing. But the point is, if you find a form of marketing that you enjoy and you do it well and you target properly, then you you will eventually find your, your audience. There are a multitude of ways, a multitude of genres, and just because you see some authors shelling out thousands in advertising doesn't mean you have to. Um, of course, some advertising will help, but what I'm going to do is share a link to an article written by Orna Rost, who's the director of the Alliance of Independent Authors. This article discusses the 10 business models that are working right now for authors. And I wanted to share it because you can see just how many models there are, how different they are, and the fact that you have the power and the ability to pick and choose which ones you want to do to make your, your you know, to create your full-time income. So I will add that link in the show notes. Takeaway three, 
finances. I know I have spoken at length about finances before. I have um, a episode ded dedicated entirely to money and debt and how to get out of debt and how to manage your finances in order to leave your job. And that was with Zach Bohannon and that's episode 11. So you can either go back into the archives or I will also leave a link in the show notes. She said, annualize your expenses and then break it down into monthly amounts. So if your expenses across the year for your writing business amount to about £1,200, or let's say you estimate it will be £1,200, then you need to put away £100 a month for them. She continued to say that budgets are vital and that you should always build in as much cushion as you can afford to, whether that's 2%, 10% or even 50% if you can. She continued to say that if you get to the end point, let's say it's the end of a budgetary year for you and you haven't spent your cushion and you have the ability to save a cushion for the next year, then she said you can always look at then spending that cushion uh, on innovative marketing or perhaps advertising. She also said no debt. I think this is something that I personally scream from the rooftops and I know that there are lots of campaigners out there like the Chooseify or the Fire Movement who are also campaigning to get our citizens of the world out of debt. She said, don't go into debt in order to publish, so don't take loans out to pay for book covers or editing, save first. Don't go into debt for advertising and definitely don't leave your job with debt hanging over you. Debt is a controversial topic, but I know that if I personally hadn't gotten out of debt, then I wouldn't have been able to leave my job. And so that's why I'm so passionate about talking about it, about, um, you know, being vulnerable about it and normalising it so that it's no longer a topic of conversation that people are afraid to open up about. I've also read a number of books on this topic, and so I will leave the links to those books in the show notes as well. So The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey, The Barefoot Investor, by Scott Pape. That is an Australian centric book, but it did definitely change my life. And so that's the one I always recommend. The Millionaire Next Door by William D. Danko and Thomas J. Stanley. Playing With Fire by Scott Rikens. And Choose a Fi by Chris Mamula, Brad Barrett and Jonathan Mendoza. So takeaway four, writing first, always. Now, this one felt like a personal dig at me because I really do struggle sometimes with this one. And so this is a lesson to me as well as to all of you. Um, the words were something along the lines of don't uh, come to your work session and sit down and reply to emails or open Facebook. The only thing that's writing is, in fact, writing. Shocking, I know. It's it's really a revelation, that. But, um, and I forget who said this. I didn't, uh, for some reason, write down uh, the name of who said this, although I do know it was a woman. Her exact words were, put the writing first. If there are no books, there's nothing to sell. Her point was this, yes, marketing and business are important, but the only thing that is quite literally essential is writing. If you want to be a writer, you actually only have to do one thing, write. You must produce books. Everything else is secondary. If you're finding you come to your writing slot and instead of doing those things, you do other things, then it's procrastination, it's fear, it's self-sabotage. Just write. It's the only thing you have to do. Telling yourself that answering DMs or reader emails or Facebook comments is writing is a lie. If you take but one thing from today's episode, then it's to always prioritise your writing. When you start your working day or your working evening or your working hour, do the words first. 
And this is the reminder that I am taking away myself from the uh, conference, is to remember to always prioritise my words. So the last takeaway then, takeaway five. Joseph Alexander talked about reader magnets. And for anyone who doesn't know what one of those is, it's a freebie, essentially. It could be anything like a cheat sheet. That's what I do for my nonfiction. I have a, um, a cheat sheet guide to help you to create your villains. It could be a prequel story or a short story or a novella set in the same world as the rest of your books. But essentially, it's something that you're giving away in exchange to, uh, for a reader's email and to entice somebody onto your mailing list so that you can then fill their days with joy and words and stories when you later publish things and they purchase your books. You might think that in today's paid advertising market world that reader magnets are no longer useful. But Joseph disagrees. He thinks they are integral to any marketing plan. He says, Amazon are never going to give you email addresses of the people who buy your books. Therefore, you must build your own list. And I couldn't agree with him more. The larger my own mailing lists grow, the easier and um, more successful each subsequent launch is. When you have a list of people already interested in your books, then, you know, it becomes an awful lot easier to sell books because you have a method of contacting those people with a vested interest. You can list build in a number of ways from using Facebook ads linking to your free reader magnet to newsletter swaps, joint box set promotions and other paid forms like Ryan Z's book sweeps list builders, which I've actually personally used and found excellent. I'm sorry, I think one of my neighbours is having building work if you can hear <laughs> some kind of metal grinder thing. Um, anyway, you, yes, where was I? <laughs> Ryan Z. Oh yes. Excellent. Excellent. Use Ryan Z. Um, if you don't have a list building read, reader magnet currently, then consider making one as soon as you can. It is words at the end of the day. It is a written asset. So, um, you know, <laughs> based on the last one where we were saying, make sure you prioritize the words. This counts, guys. This counts. Um, it, it, I think this was um, probably my second biggest takeaway. Um, I don't have a reader magnet for my fiction at the moment, despite having the cover um, completed for it. And part of that is just because I've gone through so much transition and, you know, I've been doing a variety of other things. But now is the time for me to prioritise that. Um, so I am prioritising it in the next one or two quarters. It will be done um, this year so that I can target and purposefully build my fiction reader list. Your reader magnet doesn't need to be an entire book. Of course it could be. And if we're being honest, that probably is the most effective technique, but you don't have to. I know lots of people who have done it other ways. You could, for example, use a free map of, perhaps if you have a fantasy world, you could have a map illustrated and use that. You could do bonus epilogues, character art, or character interviews, or even deleted scenes. I'm sure we all have scenes that we have removed from our um, stories and not used. You could even do a collection of short stories or flash fiction if they were in genre for your book. That is one thing I will say, make sure that um, whatever you are giving away is entirely relevant and that people, you know, so for, so for example, if you write in both the crime and the historical fiction genre, you're going to have to have two different reader magnets because historical, fi historical fiction readers may not be interested in the true crime behind your uh, crime thriller book, for example. One last takeaway is that this doesn't need to seem laborious. You can automate this system by using companies like BookFunnel, who will automatically deliver your freebie to your reader's device and also simultaneously add their email address to your mailing list. 
it's a win-win from me. <laughs> so that's it. Those were the top five takeaways from Mark Dawson's live um, SPS, SPS, SPF, whatever it was, um, SPS, I think, um, show in London. If you weren't able to attend, then you can get the um, live uh, sessions. They were filmed and they were super, super swanky filming um, thing. And he is selling those, I think, for very, very cheap, perhaps about $25 to $35. So um, very, very cheap. And you can get those on his website. So I will include a link. I'm not an affiliate. Um, I just very much enjoyed the, the, the um, conference and therefore wanted to share my takeaways and the fact that you can watch this even if you weren't there in person. I am going to leave you with what was for me the quote of the day. It made me laugh out loud and I think perhaps because it's entirely rebellious. There was a debate um, or, or discussion about ebooks and how they are so often villainized in the media and Michael Andley had this to say in response. If ebooks are the devil, then hell pays really well. Uh, ura to that, Michael. I absolutely agree. And, you know, fuck anybody else that thinks you shouldn't be publishing ebooks. Screw them. You just take the royalties. Um, so that's it. Those are my top five takeaways from the day. And that's pretty much the end of the mini episode. I will be back next week, as usual, on Wednesday with the episode. And there will be another bonus episode, which looks at the round off that I did um, of this quarter and how I am going to review the quarters going forward. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review. Mm -hmm.